Amy Chan is the next victim, I <laughs> say, for the journey this time around. Hello, Amy. How are you? Hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great. As you know, I see uh, you've followed this series uh, pretty much from inception, but you know, catching up with locals from the Albury Wodonga region, talking about their story, and, and there's sort of anybody who's followed each and every podcast would find there's probably a common link between maybe the uh, mentality of people that live in our region, which that's what I've enjoyed discovering. But... Amy Chan, let's talk about you because you're now a local children's author, I think is the best way to describe you and give you the title. But let's start with the heritage to the area. How have you ended up in Albury, Wodonga? Mm, so I moved here about eight years ago from Singapore. I'd been living in Singapore with my family and so we moved over here, two small kids and my husband. And initially when I was living in Singapore, I've always been a city girl. I've never lived like more than five kilometres from a city centre of at least sort of you know, 20 million people. So when I was told that we had a job opportunity to pursue in Albury Wodonga, I initially from Singapore said, we're going for one year. You've got one year to find another job and we're going to get out of here. (laughs) (laughs) And we got here and I just loved it. I just fell in love with the region. Um, I loved everything about it. The people are so welcoming and supportive and life is really easy here in a way that it's not in the city. And so pretty quickly I knew this was going to be my home where I wanted to raise my kids. And so we've been here for eight years now. And yeah, I still love it. I still feel very much like this is my community. This is where I belong. And yeah, really, really happy here. So what's been the success of that? Like the contrast, do you think? Has it been welcoming people or has it just simply been the lifestyle aspect? I think it's a bit of both. So in terms of welcoming people, I mean, you couldn't get a more supportive community, really. I've lived in so many places and this is the one place where... I personally have not experienced any racism. Uh, People are so supportive when I have a book that comes out or a podcast or I appear anywhere. People will come and tell me and show up and support and they will purchase. Um, And so they're really kind like that when you're going through a hard time. People that you might only bump into in the street every now and then will text and call and drop food around. Uh, But the lifestyle aspect of it is lovely as well. Um, The fact that when you speak to people... No one's ever talking about work. They're always talking about other things, what they've done with their family, what they did on the weekend, sport, um, things that interest them in the arts. And I came from a place where we were living really kind of inner city Singapore. Anyone who knows Singapore, we were living one street back from Orchard Road, which is the main sort of thoroughfare in Singapore. So to get a litre of milk, I would have to come down from the 20th floor in the lift, get to the ground floor, change lift, go down another two floors, then drive my car in a circle back to the ground floor, drive all the way around the block because I couldn't turn right at the intersection, then drive three levels down into the car park of the shopping (laughs) centre, get out, go into the lift, go back up the three floors, two escalators to go into the supermarket just to buy the milk. So what I love about this region is if I want to do anything, I just pull up right in front I walk in, they all know my name, and it's really, really easy and simple, and people want to help you. So that part of it, I think, is something that's really, really underrated, and people who live in the city and never live in a regional centre, I think, are missing out on that kind of an experience, because it does take all that stuff that you don't want to take up space in your mind, it just takes that off your plate. You, um, You touch on something I think a lot of people appreciate when they do find and unlock the secret of our region. Um, You've summarised it beautifully. Let's talk more about your career um, because I know you have a writing background, but more recently, children's author. Um, I know you brought a couple of books in today, uh, but let's talk about the sort of creative side of you, I guess, and and that being your profession. Yeah, the writer in me has always been there. So I can remember being in year two and writing books. In those days, the parents used to come in and they would type up your stories for you on a piece of paper and they'd leave a space at the bottom and as a kid you would draw in your picture and then they would bind them with those spiral plastic binders. So I still have those. Um, and at yeah, year two, year three, year four, all I ever wanted to do was be a writer. And in those days, my ambition was to be the youngest ever published writer. Obviously, that didn't happen. <laughs> but I was always writing, 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 writing. And so I had this sort of dual career where I went off to uni. I studied arts law. The arts part of it was really fulfilling. And I loved that. I did history and philosophy and feminism and literature and all those things that I really loved. And then I did this law degree that I hated. I hated every minute of it. It was excruciating. It was so boring. 
Um, and then eventually when I graduated and came out into the workforce, again, I had this dual career where I needed to earn money, but I was doing a PhD in English literature. So the PhD was amazing, loved doing that. That was just three years of immersing myself in books and, you know, learning all about the period that I was studying. And then I was working as a lawyer. Um, and initially that wasn't something that I wanted to do, but I ended up working at a legal centre in Sydney for people who have HIV. And that turned out to be really fulfilling. Um, and I really loved that, that ability to sort of use these writing skills and the ability to take really complex information, complex logistics, and essentially, I guess, translate it into a format that could not only fit the legal system, but it could also help these people to achieve whatever they needed to achieve. Um, I really enjoyed that. And so I sort of was then grappling with what do I do? Do I go and pursue the English literature side or do I go and pursue the lawyering side? Um, but we ended up at that stage, my husband and I moved to Singapore. And in Singapore, um, unfortunately, human rights law is not a strength. Mm. And particularly, there's not a lot of acknowledgement around HIV. And so that kind of ended my legal career. So then I said I've had to start all over again. So I ended up in magazines. I was an intern getting coffees and, um, you know, setting up interviews, uh, dropping off clothes for photo shoots, things like that, and pretty quickly worked my way up into being um, an editor and ended up working for some of the big women's magazines, Harper's Bazaar, Cosmo, um, freelancing for L and CNN and, you know, Condé Nast, some of the big titles like that. Um, and then eventually, sort of towards the end of that, we moved to Aubrey Wodonga. And so, again had to restart the career for now the third time because print magazines were dying. There's obviously not a huge print magazine uh, industry in this region. So then I moved to learning about online. I built my own website, which was called Suitcases and Strollers, which was all about traveling with kids under 12 um, to really far away destinations that you might not think you would take your kids to, like to Bhutan or to Africa, um, you know, hiking up Mount Fuji, things like that. Mm. And so that did really well. And all that training kind of taught me a lot more about writing for online, which is a very different way of writing to writing for print. Um, you have to be much more concise and you have to understand marketing and SEO and how to appeal to a wider audience and how to appeal to an audience that's moving really fast. And so it's sort of dawning on me as I'm speaking to you that probably all of that training is actually then what led me into children's books and picture books in particular, because I really enjoy that craft of taking something that's very complicated um, and could take up a lot of words and actually finding a way to condense it down so that something that could you could spend an hour doing a talk about, you can actually condense it down into two or three sentences that a child as young as three, four, five years old can understand. Um, and so... That seems a very long and rambling answer to your question. <laughs> no, no, it's great because it gives a snapshot of how you ended up as a children's author, which, you know, you wanted to be published as a young child. <laughs> Didn't happen, but it's been quite the journey um, to true theme um, to get back around to where you perhaps wanted to be. So the inspiration of your book, because it, it just seems like a random thing, even though now you've lovely done a summary of how you got there, but it seems like a random thing that someone has just suddenly become a children's author in Aubrey Wodonga and he's having success with it. Yeah, it do, it does feel very random. <laughs> but on the other hand, it feels like, as you say, like it's sort of coming full circle. So oh. the first book, um, which I came and talked to you and Kylie about at 2AY when it first came out, was um, called My Grandma is 100. And that one was written because it was written about my grandmother-in-law, so my husband's grandma, who I was very close to. She turned 100 years old and I wanted to find a way to record her story. And being a writer, I always thought it was going to be more of a sort of writing an interview or writing a long form story about her. So at that stage, I started to become interested in podcasting. So we set it all up. I recorded her. We spent a good two hours. And she really opened up, told me all these amazing stories about her that I didn't know. And then when I went home to listen to the recording, it had vanished. It was lost. And to this day, I still don't know where it is. Mm. So that was obviously devastating because when someone's 100 years old, you don't know how long they've got left with you. So I didn't know if I was going to ever get this information again. And so I was thinking about my kids and how I would have explained the stories to them and how they would have reacted to these stories. And that's how the idea for the children's book sort of popped into my head. And so after 40 years of not being published in a book form, I sat down, wrote this story in about a couple of hours, sent it off. And the next day, the publisher emailed me back and said, yes, we want to publish it. And so 
It is sort of one of these weird things that it took so long and yet in other ways it was so fast. And since then, each subsequent book that I've written, they come really quickly now. They, something seems to have unlocked my brain and they're coming really fast. And the other thing I've really noticed is when I'm going to schools and talking about books and talking about writing with young kids who are about that age that I was when I was first starting to do those spiral back mm. books, there's a lot of recurring themes of books and authors and... I guess, literary and cultural references that really impacted me as a kid that are still impacting my writing now. And that's something that I feel really passionate about letting young kids know is that the things that you are learning now are not worth less because you're a child. Just because you might enjoy Peppa Pig or The Avengers or things that people might think are only for children, those things are really important because they're the things that you will carry with you until you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, and they can impact your career, your sense of well-being, your creativity. These are all things that are really, really important. So I want kids to hold on to that stuff, that stuff that they're passionate about now um, can impact, yeah, who they are when they're grown-ups. So let's rattle through the other titles after that one. So we had, was The Happy Mask the next one? The next one was The Very Hungry Reader. Oh, that's right, The yes. Hungry Reader. <laughs> and then, then we had the Happy, Happy Mask. Mask. And now I've got Peg Leg Pedicure, which is due any day. It's trapped in a warehouse in Shanghai at the moment. Yes, but... like a lot of things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then how many more are we committed to from publisher? Like... Uh, um, so I think there's another four or five that are have gone to print that will come out at some point when I believe I read that Shanghai lockdown is lifting today. So once that lifts, um, the printer can start printing again. So I have one that I'm working on with Mars Pet Care called Alfie the Guard Dog. And that one, 50% of the proceeds will be donated back to Animal Rescue. Then I've got one called uh, Flow Sews, which is all about um, a little girl who's got a sibling who has special needs. And so how that kind of impacts her daily life and then the ways in which she has to use her inner resilience, even though she's very young, to try and assist, uh, assist sorry, her sibling. And then I've got one called My Uncle Lives in Antarctica, and that is about profiling a local boy whose name is Todd Heary. He grew up in Albury and he spent 18 months living in Antarctica, working at the Mawson Science Station. So that's all about his experience and what that was like. So all those are at the printer now. And then I'm working on another two at the moment with the publisher and we're still in the early stages of illustrations and that sort of thing for those two. Fantastic. Congratulations. How many years is that from first book to now? 2019 till now. So what are we now? Three years. So when everyone else has had COVID disruption, you've just kept going for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's part of what being a creative person is, right? Mm. Is you respond to things. So I think part of the lockdown really for me was we were doing a lot of reading at home with the kids. So I was going back to a lot of those books that I read when I was a little girl. But also I think part of me just wants to respond when things are happening. That's mm. part of, must be part of how I express myself. So I think... Also, podcasting is something that I basically taught myself and learnt in the lockdown. Um, and I found that all these projects seem to work really well with my kids. So the kids see their mum learning a new skill, but they also learn it with me. And so then part of that process becomes trying to let them see that these are things that they can do too if they want to. And if they don't, that's okay. But they've at least been exposed to all these other different ways of doing things that maybe they're not getting from a traditional school curriculum. So... <laughs> We've been productive, we're creative. Um, it sounds to me you're very comfortable, like you're sort of living that sort of creative is your job sort of dream, which, you know, the old saying, if you can find something that doesn't feel like work, you know, you've made it or you stick to it or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Um, what do you do when you're not being creative? Because often when I've spoken to other creative people on the journey, they don't shut down I and mean, if that's the thing they live and breathe that's just what they do because it's, it's therapeutic for them it's what they know it's what they love do you have any other hobbies like, or anything like that yeah so I play tennis um, so I play tennis often at Wodonga tennis courts or down at St Pat's um, so I love that that's a real um, yeah break away from creativity for me um, I do Pilates at self Pilates in Kiwa Street so I really love that as well um, and Sal there runs a very kind of how do I feel? like meditative sort of Pilates? So there's a lot of downtime. So I find that that's a really good way to decompress. Um, and then hanging around with friends, I really enjoy. But the lockdown did also make me embrace solidarity a bit more. Like I actually quite enjoy having 
time on my own. And I think anybody who has young kids knows that you spend the bulk of your time really when you're not working, looking after children. And so that's where I am at the moment. You know, there's realistically, there's not a lot of time to do a whole lot of things outside of work because you spend the rest of the time parenting. Mm. What do you consider to be your biggest achievement in life so far? You've spoken of a very worldly and sort of travelled, now settled life. Um, what what do you think is your biggest, biggest achievement so far? I think for me, I am really good at living in the now. So I think one of the things that I, you know, you don't want to talk up about yourself, but I suppose one of the things that I feel for me is a real strength is that I have always felt at most points in my life that if I was to get hit by a car right now after I leave the studio, I wouldn't die feeling like I wish I had done X, Y, Z. I'm not that sort of a person. If there's something that I think, "Mm, I wonder if that is possible, I just try it. If it doesn't work, that's okay, but I'm never going to die wondering. And so that's kind of how I've always done everything. When I was young, because I loved books, I knew doing a PhD was something I really, really wanted to do. And now that I'm in my 40s, I have quite a few friends around me who are doing PhDs because they're going back and doing that now, whereas I kind of knocked that out of the park very, very young. You know, I had mine by the time I was in my mid-20s. And so going along, I sort of feel like I've always just embraced the things that I'm interested in, pursued opportunities when they were there, lent into things to try them out, and whether they worked or not didn't really matter, but they opened new doors to then try other things. And so... That's probably my biggest achievement is I don't ever, I'm not a person who's sitting around thinking, gosh, there's this list of things that I really want to do and I haven't done yet. I just do them. Mm. It's refreshing to hear because a lot of people are nervous to just do things, (laughs) sort of hold themselves back, but that's refreshing to hear. And so inspirational quotes, often when I'm on the journey, we talk about just filters or things that people put on their life. Have you got anything that sticks out for you that you just, you live by a mantra or anything like that that you sort of you know, a bit of wisdom. I can't think of a specific quote off the top of my head, but I definitely think I often feel that if you want something, you just have to go and take it. Don't sit around waiting for someone to give it to you. If you want it, ask for it. And if there's no one to ask, go and try and take it. Do it. Don't sit around waiting. Um, Mm. That's definitely a theme I find when I'm speaking to friends or family or the kids about things that they're interested in or they want to achieve or obstacles that might be in their way. is very much a lean in, do it. There's no reason why nobody is going to be a better advocate for you than you. So I think your gut knows what is the right thing for you, what is the right choice to make. And every time in my life that I've got to a situation where I'm not sure which way to go, if I just wait a bit, eventually my gut will tell me and then you just do it. Don't wait for somebody to give it to you. Don't blame somebody else because you don't have it. Just do it. Now, I do understand this is something that's easy to say because we're (laughs) privileged. You know, we live in a, in a, what's the word? Not first world, but a a developed society, you know, a developed country. I'm very solidly middle class. So I understand that this doesn't apply to everybody. But I think in general, um, things are there for a reason. And so if you want something, just go and try it and then... The only person you can blame if it doesn't work out is yourself. Don't die waiting for other people to do things for you because no one's going to come and give it to you, especially if you're a woman and especially if you're a person of colour. And who are people that you admire? Like, Do you have idols or or is there someone that, you know, if their name comes up, you go, geez, they're an inspirational person? Mm, Yeah, lots. There are lots of people that I admire. Um, I love Oprah. (laughs) When you (laughs) were asking me about quotes, I was trying to think about one from Oprah. She's she's one of the people who always talks about just follow your gut. If you listen Mm. to yourself, yourself, your inner voice will tell you what to do. And I think she's really amazing because she is a woman of colour. She fought her way to the top of literally global media in a time where people of colour were not represented at all and actually continue to still not be represented. Yet she owns her own network. She's got print magazines. She's had every major interview you could ever think of. So I find her very, very inspirational. Um, But I also find a lot of the people around me in this community very inspirational. Um, I mean, I know the journey is something that is with BMG, uh, sponsored by BMG. um, So I'm not saying this just because of that. But I really feel like I was just talking to Steve Mamuni earlier in the um, waiting room and just people like that. Steve is very quiet, very softly spoken. If you were to meet him in the street, he seems very unassuming. But the amount of work that guy does around mental health for this region, 
Um, Steve and I worked for many years together on The Big Splash, which is the major fundraiser for the winter solstice, which I've also worked on. And we haven't been able to have The Big Splash for the last two years. So as a result of that, Steve's going to do some ridiculous swim where he's highly likely to die of hypothermia <laughs> yes. to you know, make up the shortfall for the fundraiser that he can't do. So there are so many quiet achievers in this community who are not on social media, they're not in the paper, they're not on the news, and yet they do these amazing things for people that they don't even know who live in this region. And there are so many people like that around here that I find them extremely inspirational. Mm. Good response. Um, tough decisions. Can we talk about tough decisions? You're very optimistic. Go get them. <laughs> you know, you're, like, you're very inspirational just listening to your journey. Have you had any tough decisions that you've had to make in life? Yeah, yeah, quite a, a few tough decisions. I would say in the scheme of things compared to other people, as I say, I've had a reasonably privileged life. I certainly never wondered where the next meal was coming from. Um, I've, you know, never been really the victim of any sort of violence or anything like that. But yeah, certainly there have been obstacles along the way. Um, I recently separated from my husband. We've been together since we were 17 years old. So really, really, really long time. Um, and that was something that I know that people around me have found quite shocking. But for me, again, it was just about my gut. I really had to listen to what my gut was telling me and I feel very strongly that in the long run this will be the best decision for me and for both of us and for our kids and our family unit and we're working very hard to um, make sure that we get along, which we do, um, so that we can still co-parent. No, tough call, but good call. Um, it's got to fit, doesn't it? It's got to fit you and it's got to fit the surrounding. Yeah. Um, sliding door moments. And forks in roads and things like that. Have you ever had any sort of, oh, that's one, I guess, but but other ones, like career-wise or, or when you were younger, where you, you wonder if something had have happened differently or you made a different decision. Have you got any that stand out? Yeah, definitely. So one of the ones I often think about is when I was in about grade five, I was attending a private girls' school in Melbourne, very, very elite, expensive private girls' school in Melbourne, and they were putting on a stage show. Because it was a private school, they have money, right? So there was a high production value in this show. And I can remember when they were doing the auditions and they were talking to us about all the different things that were going to happen. I kept putting my hand up. I had all these ideas. And the teacher pulled me aside and said, I don't want you to be in the show. I want you to be my production assistant. I want you to help me direct it. I want you to help me um, stage it. I want you to be involved in the composition of the show. And I'm not inviting any of the other girls to do it. It's just you. And at that time, we were moving house. So we were moving from one suburb to another. It wasn't going to be realistic to commute from the new house to the private girls' school. So just at the time when this came along, I ended up having to change schools. And I ended up at the local school in North Melbourne, which is where I spent the bulk of my childhood. Um, and they did do stage productions there, but it was a very, very different kind of thing. It was done with the art teacher. There wasn't a dedicated drama teacher, very low production value and quite different. Um, and so while that was all great, a big part of me does wonder what it would have been like had I had that opportunity to stay at that school, how much more I would have been involved in theatre and drama and live performance and maybe I wouldn't have had that dual thing in my life of, you know, part of me doing non-creative work and then part of me doing creative work. Maybe I would have just been a full creative. And then sometimes I wonder, would that have been a good thing or not? Because I think one of the reasons why my creativity is so, um, what's the word, I have is so stimulated and um, I'm so prolific with my creativity is because I had all that legal training and, you know, I've worked in situations that are very um, uncreative. And so I understand discipline and deadlines and presenting information in a coherent, logical format that maybe I wouldn't have had had I only been creative. I don't know. But that is one that I often think about. What would have happened if I just stayed at that private girls' school and pursued that and had teachers around me that really encouraged that creativity? How would that have been different on the kind of life that I've got now? And it's a tough one to sort of judge or look back at because I guess in year five, it's not your choice, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, if you had your time again, anything you'd do differently? No, no, I don't think so, actually. Um, because I like to just pursue things as they come up, I don't really often live with many regrets. Any regrets that I have are often small, smaller things in the sense that maybe I might regret 
having been rude to someone or come across as rude to somebody or maybe being mean to someone when I was younger. And all of those regrets often come out of insecurity, I've found. So for me, I don't have any big regrets, but I wish I'd gone here or I wish I'd done that. It's not so much that. It's more around, yeah, small moments, well, small to me, moments where maybe I have not been as kind to somebody as I could have been. And invariably, whenever I think about it, it always comes down to self-insecurity. You know, I was trying to make myself feel better about something. um, And as a result, I ended up making someone else feel worse. And so I think one of the really important things in life is to be really clear about who you are and to be comfortable in that and to be comfortable with your own um, inadequacies as well as the things that you're really good at rather than trying to cover up your inadequacies because for me, every time I've tried to do that, it's resulted in something that I end up regretting um, and it's potentially hurtful to somebody else. You've just explained a bit of maturity there too. I think I think everyone would relate to that, thinking, geez, it's an awkward moment in life there somewhere I could have just done something a bit better or maybe just approached it sooner rather yeah. than letting it fester. Yeah. And we've, we look at good things. You've had a lot of good things. You keep reflecting upon the privileged life that you've had. Uh, best thing that's ever happened to you? Hmm. I don't know. Again, because I always just pursue the things that I'm interested in, I don't know that I can have just one best thing. Um, I think getting the first book published was a really big thing for me. I think that that was something that as a writer, when you're a writer but you don't have a book, there's definitely like a, I guess there's a sense of self-doubt around that. And I had finally actually got to the stage where I was like, I'm okay with this. I'm not going to have a book and that's fine. And I'm actually all right now. That's not a regret. And then the book got accepted for publication. And that's kind of opened up all these channels. And as you say, I feel like now I'm really living a fully creative life, which is what I always wanted to do when I was little. But there are many other things too that I think have been very lucky. I, My first magazine job in Singapore, when I went into that, they said to me, if we end up employing you as a full-time employee and a writer, what beats do you want to cover? And I said, I want to do dining, food, and I want to do travel. And that's what they gave me. And so then for several years about 10 or 15 years, I just spent time eating in restaurants for free (laughs) and traveling all over the world. I would have been to nearly 50 countries. So that was amazing. So so I've had a lot of um, opportunities like that in life where I feel like, yeah, most of the things that I've dreamt about or really wanted to do, I've managed to very luckily do. And so, yeah, it'd be hard to distill it down to just one. Mm. Good answer. And hindsight? wonderful thing. (laughs) What advice would you give a younger you? Just be true to yourself. You know, don't listen to the naysayers. Don't let people tell you you can't do it. Don't let people tell you you're not good enough. Just believe in yourself and trust yourself because you know what is the right thing for you. Don't worry that other people say, oh, you should do science or you should do medicine or you're not as good because you can't speak Chinese or You're not as good because you are Chinese. Just be true to yourself and pursue the things that you want to do because it's a really fast-changing world, especially right now. Things like that that when I was younger, for instance, being Chinese was a real disadvantage. Now it's quite the opposite because we we have diversity quotas. Mm. And so, you know, the world that you think is the world when you are 14, 15, 16 is not the world you're going to end up in when you're an adult. It's very, very different. And so... Just be true to yourself because that's the only thing that you can rely on is yourself. Thinking ahead, five to ten years from now, yeah, you've just described in this journey a little bit of personal upheaval recently. You've explained the past extremely well and quite succinctly. What do you think the next five to ten years looks like for Amy Chan? I would love, 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 love to have some sort of production that involves actors. So at the moment, I'm fighting quite hard to get my book, The Happy Mask, adapted into a stage production. Um, And so what's missing from that really at the moment is money. When I need a big sponsor to essentially pay to get it on the stage in front of kids. So if it's not that, the other thing I'd be interested in is um, a TV production. So I've had three or four different ideas out there that are sitting with production companies and... They may or may not get picked up with networks. That's something that's completely out of my control. But 
that's something that really interests me as well is moving into looking at how um, you can translate these stories into a visual format, whether on the stage or on the screen. That's something I'd be really interested to explore. So I would love if in the next five years I've sort of achieved that goal and at least one of those projects or something similar has come to light. Um, but I imagine in the next five years things will be quite different for me because my eldest son will be nearly 18, so he'll be moving on to uni. The younger one now will be, you know, mid-high school, and so life will be quite different in um, that time. And I think I'll be looking at, you know, empty nester syndrome pretty soon after that. And so then the creative opportunities and work opportunities will be quite different when I'm not such a hands-on parent by that stage, hopefully. Do you think you're on track to achieve the goals? Or do you think you're stepping off in the right way? I think I'm doing everything possible, Kev, to try <laughs> to to get that done. As I, you know, have been saying to you over the last few minutes, you know, I try to lean into things. So I've definitely tried to pursue the opportunities that are in front of me as much as possible. So if it doesn't happen, it won't be for want of trying. <laughs> Um, we're slowly going to ease COVID out of this conversation of the journey. It disrupted everyone, including this series. Um, put us at hold there for a second when we couldn't catch up face to face and all the rest and everybody else was doing Zoom. So we didn't really embrace that. We just waited till we could meet again. Mm. Um, significant moment in history, global pandemic. We can look back at what the last one was like, <laughs> whether we've learned from anything or not from that, I'm not too sure. Um, now that we're at the other side of it, or starting to come out the other side of it, uh, how's it impacted you? What do you think has done to change you? It's definitely taught me to slow down in terms of feeling that I need to meet other pe people's expectations. So I feel really comfortable now to say if there's a weekend where maybe we get invited to five or six events to say, no, we're not going to go to all those events. And it's not because I have something on and it's not because I'm going to lie to you and say that, you know, X, Y, and Z reason. I'll just say, no, we need time we need downtime. And I think that that's okay. So that's one thing it's taught me. Um, the other thing it's taught me is just about the pace at which we were going before the pandemic. And it's been really interesting, particularly I feel like this year, watching people around me uh, picking up things and going even faster than they were before. And I feel like a bit of that is FOMO. Like people are like, oh my gosh, for two years I haven't been anywhere, haven't done anything, we couldn't have parties, we couldn't see people, so I'm going to madly do everything that I couldn't do for the last two years, as well as the whole schedule of what we were doing before we went into a lockdown. And I feel like if you're doing that, you're kind of missing the point of what the whole disruption was about. It's a real opportunity for us to reset, rethink about the way we live our lives, and think about the way we kind of set expectations for ourselves and for other people. I think particularly for women who are working and parenting at the same time, this is an opportunity for us to say, do you know what? Having to leave work at 2.30 to do, go do the school pickup is not the end of the world. <laughs> not having, not coming into the office between nine and five, you know, 35 weeks of the year is not the end of the world. Having to job share and work from home and work remotely and maybe have kids in the background that come in and out of your work Zooms is not the end of the world. This should be an opportunity actually for people who have... I think, being lesser in the workforce and had less opportunities to be able to take all these learnings and say, do you know what? We should be on an equal footing with everybody else. Working part-time, having kids in your life, choosing to take time off work to get pregnant or care for elderly parents or whatever it is should just be normal because we've lived like that for two years and there has not been any significant impact. So this is something that we should take and move forward with and, you know, Get something positive out of the pandemic because so much of it was so negative. Yeah, avoid the COVID catch-up. That's what it, I've labelled it, the COVID catch-up where everyone's tried to do two things because they've missed out on it. Just do yeah. it once. We'll support the once and yes. that'll be fine. Yeah, exactly. Um, as we start to wrap up, oldie bit of goodie, three people at your dinner party, dead or alive, who would they be? Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely Oprah. And then I'll be dead by the end of the dinner party <laughs> I love Oprah so much. Um, I'd probably choose... A writer, I think, um, as well. One of the great writers, maybe. Part of me wants to instinctively say a female writer, like a Jane Austen or a Charlotte Bronte, but I actually think potentially if it's a dinner party, some of the male writers might be more interesting only in the sense that those writers from that period of time, the 19th century, 
that I'm really passionate about. Um, you know, they were out and about in society, whereas a lot of the women were sort of stuck at home. So mm. you might have more interesting dinner party conversations. So maybe somebody like a Charles Dickens or a, um, a Thackeray would be somebody that I'd be interested in. And then I would love somebody fun from the creative world now, somebody like Taika Waititi or, um, yeah, somebody who's really interesting and fun, who's in the pop pop culture world now, who's making content. I think it would be really interesting to hear those stories of what life is like for him working in Hollywood, you know, comes from New Zealand, so really close neighbour to Mm. us, but having such extraordinary success, I think it would be great to have somebody like that. Sweet or savoury, what's on the table? Savoury. (laughs) <laughs> Good one. Um, and what's an ordinary weekend look like? Um, you've, you've spoken in there about releasing some of your plans on a weekend. Just make sure you're not overcommitting and you are taking time out. What does a, a normal weekend look like for you now? Mm, so we try to do... So we usually have soccer one day of the week for one of my kids. The other one may or may not have an activity, depending on if we have any social things on. So if we have social things on, then he won't have an activity. But if we've got nothing on, then I'll schedule something in for him. I try and do something one night of the weekend. So either Friday or Saturday night, we'll see friends or go to a party or maybe we'll go out for dinner. And then the rest of the time is just family downtime. So whether it's that we go out and last weekend we played in the leaves. I'm glad we did that because it's raining and miserable (laughs) now. And I think that's over. (laughs) And that's a tradition for us. Every um, autumn we go to Norial Park and, you know, we make a big pile of the leaves and they roll around in them and they have fun. Um, Or sometimes it's just chill out at home, you know. Maybe we'll pick a Netflix series and we'll just binge that together as a family with some popcorn and, you know, in our pyjamas and eat some takeaway pizza. So, yeah, I definitely try and schedule it so that there is a good balance of downtime but then a few activities to get us out of the house. Well, you've almost got to the last question on your own there. We're starting to ask people on the journey our recommendations. Now, we know we want people to be a fan of the journey, but podcasts, binge watching, is there anything that you recommend that people should give a try and get into? What are you enjoying? Um, I just discovered a podcast series called Smartless, um, which I don't know if you've heard of, but it's uh, with Jason Bateman, um, Will Arnett, and then Sean something or other, who's the guy from Will and Grace. Yes. So I stumbled onto this initially because they've got a lot of celebrities in the podcast, I guess because they're from Hollywood. And when I started listening to it, I was initially like, "Mm, I don't know. Often these podcasts, uh, you've got to fast forward the first 15 minutes because there's a lot of banter that's very personal, sort of wasting time. It's not well edited. And then the last 10 minutes you've got to fast forward. You're just trying to get to the celebrity interview in the middle. But when I started listening to this, the banter is hilarious, hilarious, <laughs> really great. It's tight, so it's usually under five minutes, so it doesn't go too long. They're constantly interrupting the guest, but the way they interrupt, interrupt the guest is always really funny and very insightful. Um, and it's really, when I heard it, I was like, this is what a podcast is supposed to be. So I've really, really enjoyed listening to that. Everyone they interview is Hollywood celebrity, so from that sense, I really enjoy that insight into those people who are making films and movies and TV shows and, you know, um, are being creative at that kind of top, very, very popular level. Um, And so that's a really great one if you are into podcasting. Fantastic. Amy Chan, The Journey, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. I've known you for many years, but I've learnt lots about you today and I'm sure anybody listening or watching um, will be doing the same. So thanks so much. No, thanks for having me. (laughs) 